Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Respiratory Endpoints, Scientific Leadership in the Asia Pacific Region. My name is Diane and I will be your X Talks host for today. And today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. And this webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit any questions or comments you may have for our speakers throughout the presentation and you may do so by using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. You can find this chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen and if you require any other assistance please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time all participants are in a listen only mode and please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point I would like to thank George Clinical who helped develop the content for this webinar. George Clinical is a leading independent clinical research organization based in Asia with over 250 staff operating in 13 countries. George Clinical provides the full range of clinical trial services to pharmaceutical, medical device and biotech customers for all trial phases, registration and post-marketing trials. George Clinical combines scientific and clinical leadership with expert trial delivery capability to create a distinctive world-class service. George Clinical's parent organization, the George Institute for Global Health, is a leader in chronic disease research with a global network of experts with whom George Clinical engages. And George Clinical delivers an operationally supported, internationally recognized scientific leadership service, bringing together an extensive series of investigator networks that allow George Clinical to provide customizable clinical trial excellence from trial design through all aspects of delivery. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our first speaker is Professor Christine Jenkins. Christine is Head of Respiratory Trials at the George Institute for Global Health, Senior Staff Specialist in Thoracic Medicine at Concord Hospital in Sydney, and Clinical Professor and Head of Respiratory Discipline at the University of Sydney. And she has been Principal Investigator and has led many investigator-initiated and competitively funded clinical trials in airway disease. And she is also the Chair of the Lung Foundation in Australia. And our second speaker for today is Dr. Marisa Peterson. Marisa has worked for over 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry, fulfilling roles in regulatory affairs, clinical research and project management. Prior to joining George Clinical, Marissa was the Vice President Asia Pacific for Omnicare Clinical Research, a global CRO, taking responsibility for the delivery of trials in the Asia Pacific region and developing a network of offices across the region to effectively service customer needs. In her current role, Marissa is focused on sustainable growth of resources in the region and delivery of regional and global studies to the highest international standards. And now without further ado, I would like to hand over the microphone to our first speaker for today, Christine. And Christine, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you, Diane, and good day, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of this WebEx, and I hope uh, it's helpful to you all. I noticed from the participants that many of you would be very familiar with clinical trials design, and I'm going to emphasize particularly some of the aspects of clinical trials design in relation to COPD. It's uh, a, a disease with a very substantial burden and uh, as we know um, it's one that is not um, as yet well resolved. Um, at its best a clinical trial shows what can be accomplished with a medicine that is uh, carefully observed and in certain restricted conditions. But Bradford Hill way back in 84 when clinical trial design was still underway uh, said that uh, it variably it is not observed in the same way when it passes into use in the wider community. And so between measurements based on RCTs and benefit in the community there's a gulf which has been much underestimated. And this is of course Archie Cochrane saying this and hence one of the reasons for establishing uh, the Cochrane collaboration. 
So when we choose between uh, patient uh, treatment options, we are often using uh, very substantial um, evidence which has been gained at population level. And when we look at everybody on this beach, we see that uh, there's a huge array of people on this beach. And when a physician reads a clinical guideline, they are reading one which has usually been derived from clinical trials which have defined the preferred options for the whole population on average. Uh, these very well characterised uh, clinical trial populations do not necessarily reflect what is happening uh, in, the, in the individual. And in that instance, we really need effectiveness trials to look at the broad range of people in the community. So patient level medication choices, which clinicians are engaged with every day in their practice, are really very carefully defined by the particular clinical characteristics that a patient has. And a physician, when prescribing, is trying to think about what are the unique features of this person that mean that this particular intervention or medication will be optimal for them. And this is where population level results and on average results that come to us in large RCTs are not necessarily helpful. So we talk about precision medicine these days, but RCTs actually rarely provide the kind of information that enable us to practice precision medicine. So let's look at polling question number one. Indeed, we do have a polling question for our attendees right now, and I'm just going to launch that in everyone's screens. And the polling question is, according to the WHO, how many people die each year from COPDs? And this is more like a, a pop quiz question, really. And for attendees, you can vote live on your screen, and you have four options right here that you could choose from, and that's 5 million, 4.8 million, 3 million, and 3.8 million. So according to the WHO, how many people die each year from the COPDs? And again, uh, for this polling question, you can vote live on your screen, and I encourage everyone to do so. And I see uh, most of you have voted. I'm just going to keep this polling question as is so that most of you can vote. And again, I encourage everyone to do so. Okay, wonderful. Looks like most of you have voted. I'm just going to close this polling question right now and share with everyone the answers to the polling question as well as reveal the correct answer. And according to the polling question, 42% of you said 3.8 million, a 25% of you said 3 million and 4.8 million, and an 8% says eight, 5 million. And the correct answer to this polling question is um, 3 million, so approximately 3 million of an estimated 6% of all deaths worldwide. And I believe we have a second polling question after this as well. And um, again, I'm going to launch this with everyone's screens. And the second polling question we have for today is, according to the WHO, what percentage of COPD deaths occur in low to middle income countries? And like the first polling question, you can go live on your screen. And over here, you have four options. That's 90%, 95%. 75% and 80% and I encourage everyone to vote and I see some of you have voted and I hope that most of you are able to vote for our polling question and again according to the WHO what percentage of COPD deaths occur in low to middle income countries okay it looks like most of you have voted I'm just gonna close the polling question right now and share the answers with everyone uh, to what everyone has voted and also reveal the correct answer to this polling question and it looks like a 33% of you said 90 also a 33% at 75 and 80 and a 0% at 95 and for this polling question the correct answer is uh, the first one at 90% approximately 90% of COPD deaths occur in low to middle income countries and with that I would like to hand over the mic back to you. Thank you Diane. I think the most interesting thing about this is that the WHO figures are almost certainly underestimating the deaths from COPD and we must remember that very frequently they are confounded with deaths from cardiac disease because cardiac disease uh, accounts for around 30% of deaths amongst uh, people with COPD and because it looks so similar in so many ways when someone is acutely breathless 
almost certainly these figures underestimate the deaths from COPD globally, as death certificates tend to do the same. Uh, so really when we're looking at individuals, we are almost always looking at um, treatments that have been estimated in a very large RCT. And in those RCTs, as commented on this particularly useful paper uh, by uh, Peter Rothwell in The Lancet in 2005, in the end, clinicians are making judgments on the basis of those RCTs, but the reporting of the determinants of external validity in trial publications and systematic reviews is usually inadequate. And this applies uh, less so now to Cochrane uh, reviews and systematic uh, meta-analyses, but it is still absolutely true that the external validity of trials is very poorly reported and therefore very difficult for clinicians to um, to know whether or not the patient uh, is that they're treating is is represented in this study. Uh, so looking at the external validity of RCTs and COPD, this is a study that uh, was based on a postal survey randomly sent to uh, people who lived in Wellington, New Zealand. And then they were randomly selected uh, when they completed the trial, although there was a, a selection process in, in that only um, about 80% of the patients sent back their, uh, their questionnaire. Uh, over 90% of COPD subjects in the community who were taking medication as a result of this particular questionnaire and their responses, the uh, investigators drew the conclusion that they were taking that medication on the basis of RCTs for which they would not have been eligible. In other words, they found that they either had more bronchodilator responsiveness, they had comorbidities, they were taking other treatments, they were in an age range which would have meant they were not eligible for the clinical trials in RCT, RCTs published um, at that time. What about uh, other, other trials? They were treatment trials that those investigators were looking at. This is pulmonary rehabilitation trials. This is a very nice study. It looked at um, RCTs which were originally included in the Cochrane Pulmonary Rehabilitation Review. 31 RCTs and only 12% of them actually described in detail adequate for physicians to prescribe that this treatment or intervention, the number of patients who are contacted and their characteristics. And so in these studies, 40% were deselected before randomization because they did not qualify. So again, in a non-therapeutic intervention or in a non-pharmacologic intervention, uh, they concluded that most RCT study populations of pulmonary rehab are not sufficiently representative of the COPD target population. Uh, looking at asthma trials, exactly the same features are evident. So the inclusion criteria almost always require excellent inhaler technique, adherence with the designated treatment, pre-specified levels of airflow obstruction and reversibility, no comorbidities, and a smoking status which is usually less than 10 pack years, when in fact 30% of asthma subjects in most countries at least are concurrent smokers. So again, um, this is not unique to COPD trials and this simply shows that across the board in airways disease trials, uh, patients in RCTs are not necessarily representative. Uh, in this study, uh, they looked at COPD trials against this is uh, really uh, six very, very major recent large RCTs. Eclipse is not an intervention trial, but it's an observational trial of great significance for the COPD world uh, and um, whether or not they were representative. And what they showed was that in the, the patients who were in the, the large um, uh, randomized control trials were more likely to be younger, more likely to be male, they had worse lung function and worse quality of life scores than patients in the general population and patients from the population from which they had been selected. And they concluded that the proportion of primary care patients eligible for inclusion in these longitudinal um, pharmacologic RCTs ranged from 17% to a maximum best of 42%. And, and so 17% is is again an appallingly low proportion of uh, patients who generally 
um, would be in the wider population and in this case in, in primary care. So um, I'm going to go back over a little bit of history very, very briefly and talk about COPD endpoints and how they have evolved and then particularly about exacerbations and regulatory expectations. Uh, in COPD, we have a disease that is defined uh, mostly pathologically and physiologically. And yet, in the end, what we're dealing with is a patient who is breathless. And we therefore have this disconnect between the symptoms and the pathology and physiology. And this is really a major problem for uh, randomised control trials. Because which endpoint are we to use? Is it the symptomatic endpoint that affects the patients? or is it the endpoints that we believe reflect the physiology, such as the FEV1? And we've evolved through a series of trials from the 1980s when the early studies were done to gradually incorporating more patient reported outcomes. Also reporting mortality and disease progression, such as began to happen in the 2000s particularly, um, looking at whether or not pharmacologic interventions could reduce the rate of lung function decline in COPD. And subsequently to 2010, we have really phenotyped patients in trials, in observational studies and also in RCTs. We've looked at adverse effects more, if, more beneficially, particularly, for instance, in the recent TSP trial, looking at anticholinergics and adverse events. Very, very large study, um, really uh, extremely well conducted. And we've moved now to most recently, for instance, the two Salford studies, the asthma and COPD studies run by GlaxoSmithKline, um, in Salford, UK, looking at real-world studies in a very meaningful way in airways disease. Uh, one of the challenges, or many of the challenges to COPD trials are listed here. One of them is that COPD is defined by GOLD, the Global Guidelines on Obstructive Lung Disease, as persistent airflow limitation that's usually progressive and poorly reversible. It's a destructive disease, lung tissue is lost and we don't know how to restore it. Patients present late, so they're extremely breathless and often severely obstructed by the time they are receiving interventions. And yet, as I said, we recruit patients into trials who are generally milder. The COPD population is highly heterogeneous. There are patients who progress slowly, patients who progress rapidly, patients who have a big burden of symptoms for their degree of obstruction, and patients who have a light burden. COPD can't be measured by just one or two outcomes, therefore. We have to have multiple outcomes to look at the spectrum of possible effects of medications and interventions. And patient reported outcomes and objective endpoints don't have tight correlations, which I'll show you in a moment. And ultimately the goal is to intervene early and yet the patients present late and so recruiting these earlier patients into trials is particularly challenging. This just shows you uh, from the Eclipse study the degree of uh, uh, spectrum. If you look at the top, for instance, left-hand um, panel, what you see is the modified MRC score, the breathlessness score, going from zero on the bottom of the vertical axis to uh, five or four on, on the top. And across the horizontal axis you see, and this is how it's represented in all these panels, the severity of FEV1 impairment. And what you can see is, say you choose 40% um, uh, FEV1 impairment, you can see that some patients have virtually zero dyspnea, while others have a dyspnea score of six, an MMRC score of six, meaning that they are so disabled they hardly ever leave the house. So this is one of the challenges. If you look to the right-hand top panel, you see the FEV1 again on the horizontal axis and the six minute walk distance. And again, if you choose 40, you'll see there are people with a six minute walk distance of 100 metres and people with a six minute walk distance of six to 800 metres. Vastly different. And so the, that's what I'm wanting to, to emphasise, the fact that these correlations between symptoms and physiologic abnormality are very weak. So you need to measure both, and this just goes to the SGRQ, the St George's Respiratory Questionnaire's Quality of Life, and again you see this very, very wide scatter. So again, if you choose an FEV1 of 40% predicted, you'll see that there are people whose SGRQ is extremely low, that is, it's relatively good quality of life with a low SGRQ of around 20, 
up to an SDRQ of 80 plus, in which instance these people have appalling quality of life. And this is a respiratory-based uh, quality of life questionnaire, not a general health status questionnaire. When you look at changes in lung function, so in a clinical trial we're interested in change and, uh, and when you look at this, this is a pooled analysis from three studies of indicatorol, the long-acting beta agonist. And what they looked at was uh, the relationship between changes in those patient reported outcomes such as the SGRQ or the TDI transitional dyspnea index, this is a breathlessness um, performance score, and they correlated it with FEV1. And what they showed was that the cohort correlations were strong, which is of course what we see in RCTs, but the individual correlations are weak, which is what we try to work out in an individual. When I'm prescribing, I want to know how much is this intervention going to help this person's breathlessness, not just how much it's going to help their FEV1. And what this is telling me is that I cannot base my decision on the FEV1 if I think it's breathlessness that I want to, to improve. And this shows for the patients uh, on the left-hand panel, let's concentrate in the, very, in the four different categories. This is severe and not severe receiving inhaled steroids and um, moderate and, and uh, receiving inhaled steroids or not. And what you see is that for patients who have significant FEV1 improvements, they actually tend to have um, smaller improvements in, for instance, their number of inhaled medication, uh, reliever medications they take, or the number of exacerbations they have per year. So again, quite a marked disconnect between these two things. Uh, so what should we measure? This is really a big challenge in COPD trials, and uh, the traditional outcome for COPD studies is, is the FEV1. But we define this as a poorly reversible disease, so why are we targeting a, a phenomenon that is very poorly responsive to intervention? Um, it is still, however, the most common outcome in COPD trials assessed by the FDA and the EMA for regulatory improvement, though it can be expressed in these several different ways. Its strengths are that it's highly reproducible when it's performed by trained personnel, but it has um, very um, significant um, correlation with some important endpoints such as all-cause respiratory and cardiovascular mortality. It can be graded so it's, it fits well in clinical uh, guidelines. It can be used to assess bronchiolator responsiveness but I'll show you later why that is not necessarily the ideal reason for its incorporation. But there are many subcategories such as area under the curve or 0 to 3 hours, 0 to 24 hours. It has several weaknesses. It's poorly reproducible if it's not well performed. It fails to identify phenotypic differences with an FEV1 that's similar. As I've shown you, there can be vast differences in patient reported outcomes. It relates very weakly to exercise performance, functional status, which is what affects the patient. There's no minimal clinically important difference defined, although people have postulated 100 mils, but that is a relatively arbitrary figure. So which outcomes should we measure next? The old paradigm is static based on the FEV1, a static lung function measure that is very poorly responsive as I've said. More recently people have looked much more carefully in clinical trials at exercise capacity, dyspnea assessments and activity indices using pedometers, activity monitors, accelerometers, which really do give you very detailed information about patient activity. COPD patients do a lot less than other patients and um, that can be potentially improved and is therefore a very good target for a therapeutic intervention. Uh, these uh, endpoints have also extended to systemic and metabolic effects such as um, weight loss or fat-free muscle mass, um, bone mass density, and also to prognostic in, uh, composite indicators such as the the body, uh, the BMI, the obstruction, dyspnea, and um, exertional um, exercise capacity endpoints. So these composite scores can be very, very useful. Uh, we've used the COPD assessment test as a very useful test, again, um, uh, easy for patients to complete. Correlates very well with the SGRQ, much easier for patients to complete. Uh, it also is responsive to um, interventions and to exacerbations. As you can see, exacerbated patients have higher scores uh, and these effect sizes can be assessed for interventions.
This is the CAT score in response to pulmonary rehabilitation showing very substantial reduction in amongst responders compared to um, uh, patients who do not receive the intervention or non-responders. So looking way back, one of the first studies really re well respected RCTs was the Soldi study and uh, in this study it was shown that um, patients who had received an inhaled steroid, uh, this study was recruiting in the late 1990s, um, had a much more significant delay to uh, worse, significant worsening of their quality of life as seen in the right panel. But these patients were selected from a very wide catchment, all people with COPD in the locations of the uh, clinical trial centres. Within that, people with COPD who exacerbated or were persistently symptomatic were selected. Within that group, people who attended specialist clinics in 18 tertiary UK hospitals and within that group who were willing to participate of, and um, were going to receive an inhaled steroid versus placebo over three years and were current or former smokers and had all these characteristics. So you can see very easily how highly selective even the Isoldi trial was and it is indeed far less selective than many of the more recent studies. Uh, in this study there was a very high withdrawal rate and that withdrawal rate made it very difficult because what happened was that patients who withdrew were more likely to be the sicker patients and what this does is it means the placebo group um, had a more rapid decline in FEV1 and more exacerbations, more people withdrawing and as a result there's a healthy survivor effect in the placebo group even when the intervention, the inhaled steroid is effective. So you end up with a smaller difference between your placebo group and your intervention group because more people withdraw from the placebo group because the drug is ineffective it, it, placebo is ineffective compared to your intervention of interest. So we have come to the point where COPD exacerbations have a sort of holy grail significance in COPD trials and uh, many people would challenge this now but we are still going through this process because the FDA highly values this outcome and because it's a very, very costly outcome for healthcare systems. Uh, it's measured by symptoms, so it's, it, it's based on what patients experience and what doctors do, treatment. It's therefore patient oriented and it has clinical resource and resource out impact because of its, its strong um, uh, relationship to, to what patients and doctors do. But it's not objective, it's difficult to grade the severity, it varies with healthcare systems, some of which admit a lot of patients and some of which admit very few patients or even where patients don't necessarily present to the emergency department or to primary care but self-manage. And so it's not comparable between studies. This is how it's defined and although this has been slightly modified, this was the very first um, uh, really widely implemented um, description and definition of a COPD exacerbation, a sustained worsening of the patient's condition from the stable state. So in a variable disease, this is very hard to define, more variable than usually variable. Beyond normal day-to-day -day variation, that's acute in onset, also hard to define, and may warrant additional treatment, may warrant, and some people will prescribe for that, and that prescription of antibiotics or corticosteroids or both is what defines exacerbations in most studies. So here we go, we could um, open up all of these definitions uh, at the same time, and you'll see that they differ very slightly, sometimes by requiring uh, simply the prescription of the antibiotic or the steroid, depending on the patient's presentation, um, or else requiring a duration, such as in the uplift study of three days or more, and requiring that treatment. Um, or, and similarly in the macrolides study, which is a very um, important and interesting uh, study. Why are they an important outcome? I have mentioned this already, we could open up all these pointers, they predict mortality, they also predict probability of exacerbating in the next year, they are key drivers of long-term morbidity, they happen increasingly frequently as patients become sicker and they're very strongly associated with health status, much more strongly for instance than uh, the FEV1 is as I've shown you in, in earlier studies. They are potentially reducible, which is obviously a key value of them for RCTs. And here it shows you quite clearly how they correlate with uh, 
probability of uh, death. So this you can see patients who had three or more exacerbations in this longitudinal co uh, Copenhagen uh, heart study cohort uh, were much more likely to die than those who had no exacerbation. So exacerbations are a marker of um, morbidity and mortality. Uh, they also um, in happen to increase with COPD severity. So again, they are a nice correlation with severity that FEV1 doesn't necessarily provide. Um, the FDA confirms that they are a very useful measure and that they believe that they should be um, incorporated into clinical trials and that they are as valuable, if not more valuable, as the FEV1, although the FDA does not recommend, it, recommend it, abandoning the FEV1. The EMA also values uh, exacerbations as an endpoint. Uh, but one of the important things about exacerbations is we have no measure of severity apart from whether or not patients were admitted to hospital or not. And as I've mentioned, this is very much dependent on, a, on the healthcare environment in which that the exacerbation occurs. They're also highly seasonal because they're predominantly triggered by respiratory viruses. I've emphasised some of the um, practical problems. If you focus on the bottom of this slide, I, I think these are evolving issues. The local variation in health resource use. In most Western countries, there is a strong um, initiative in uh, healthcare environments to reduce hospital admissions from COPD and to help patients to self-manage. And uh, primary care practitioners and specialists are actively encouraged to use written action plans and give patients a supply of antibiotics and oral steroids to manage for themselves. Patients also under-report under their COPD exacerbations, which can be overcome by digital monitoring and by exact score, various scores that, that enable them to input into an electronic diary day by day. Um, exacerbation rates in most trials are higher than occur in patients across the board. As I've already mentioned, in primary care exacerbation rates are not as frequent as they are in patients in clinical trials. Um, and so therefore, patients in clinical trials by virtue of being selected because they have had an exacerbation in the last year, which is very, very common um, uh, requirement for a clinical trial. This makes these patients almost instantly not representative of the broader COPD population. So there are possible solutions. I've mentioned some of the issues on the left-hand side, but some of the solutions are shorter trials which reduce withdrawal um, rates and uh, help to keep the difference between the placebo and the intervention um, as it truly is. Uh, using composite scores and not just focusing on exacerbations which helps also to have a more broad representation of patient benefit. Um, using phone calls during the trial in order to ascertain if the patient has worsened rather than present to a healthcare environment for a prescription, self-medicated for instance. Using electronic diaries which are really well used by COPD subjects. Many people think that they're older and they're not necessarily digitally intuitive and they're certainly not digitally well trained but they can certainly use electronic diaries to record their symptoms and exacerbations and medications and developing more objective criteria, which is still a challenge in the COPD world. Uh, I think external vid validity is a very big issue in clinical trials, and um, I would like to emphasise that we really should be looking at much, uh, expressing much more uh, clearly the uh, external validity of RCTs and how the, the study population truly was selected and therefore is or is not representative of the wider COPD population. Um, I think that in consort diagrams we could make it very much more clear how patients were sub-selected and uh, in Cochrane reviews we are now seeing a very significant uh, effort to uh, look at the external validity of a study. An external validity checklist would be a really helpful thing for us to use in RCTs to help clinicians know how representative the RCT is. So this uh, checklist would, would include um, the setting of the trial, whether it was in a healthcare environment that was secondary or tertiary, which is obviously highly selective in its own right, the country in which the patient was recruited, uh, the mechanism of recruitment, 
um, how patients were screened before randomization, what their eligibility and, and uh, uh, ineligibility criteria were. I notice very commonly now as journals shorten um, the, their publication uh, sizes that uh, eligibility or extensive ineligibility criteria are listed in the supplementary indices. This makes it very unlikely that readers will go to it. Going to the supplementary index is really, uh, you have to be online, not reading the PDF, and you have to be able to be bothered to do it and have the time to do it. And uh, I think this is a very serious deficit in current publications of RCTs. Um, the ratio of randomised patients, uh, that is those who were eligible compared to those who were ineligible, also gives you a very good idea whether 20% of the patients were eligible or 70% of the patients were eligible is clearly going to give you a hint about generalizability. And then, of course, the more broad characteristics of those who were randomised, really showing what the sort of patient this is and whether or not they had comorbidities as well. So in summary, it's easy and I think getting easier, unfortunately, because of the highly selective nature of RCTs to overlook the extent of selection that operates when patients are recruited into clinical trials. It makes generalizability of results exceptionally challenging. This lack of information, I think, makes it difficult to, uh, for prescribers to determine the applicability and the safety of an intervention. And this is especially so in RCTs which are powered on a primary outcome which generally speaking occurs much more commonly than the adverse events. And the adverse events therefore is identifying these is exceptionally um, challenging. Uh, despite the enthusiasm for um, uh, uh, phenotypes, in fact, I think RCTs, the large RCTs and COPD virtually never pre-specify analyses that address these. And uh, it's often in retrospective analyses that particular features are identified and then the RCT has to be performed that selects for that or balances for that in the, in the uh, stratification and randomization. Uh, the RCT reporting sometimes includes the proportion of responders. For instance, the proportion of responders who achieve a minimal clinically important difference of an improvement in the St George's Respiratory Questionnaire of four or greater but not the characteristics of these participants. I'm interested to know that 40% of patients have an SGR2Q improvement of greater than four, but what I really want to know as a prescriber is what are the characteristics of those patients? Not only so I prescribe the drug for the right patient, but that I don't prescribe the drug for somebody who's unlikely to benefit. So I've mentioned some solutions already to uh, these problems. I'm very mindful of time and uh, I think we might skip over the next 10 slides if we could, Deanne, please, and go okay. to slide 57 and the real world studies. And patient, people can have a look at these particular slides um, when uh, the WebEx is over. I think I've mentioned um, many of these uh, potential solutions, but I think they're important in trying to tailor uh, recruitment and uh, description of, of the uh, interventions and the endpoints so that prescribers who are the, the intended audience for clinical trials uh, can make wise decisions about individuals. The person who is prescribing wants to know, do the results of this study apply to my patient? Oscar Wilde, the pure and simple truth is rarely pure and never simple and as I've outlined this is particularly the case in large RCTs. One of the solutions therefore is to think about including this whole population and not just a, a selected subgroup. So if we look at this whole population we see people doing all sorts of different things. People just lazing around on the beach, people being physically active in the water, people doing their own thing, getting very very vigorous. We need to know are these trials applicable to these people. And one of the ways is to do effectiveness research. And I know you're all very familiar with effectiveness research so that you can really look at results that are much more generalizable to the wider population. So uh, two studies actually have recently been published. This one in COPD in the Salford uh, Lung Study uh, in the New England Journal published last year. A really valuable study and shows how it can be done for airways disease. One of the crucial things about this study is that in Salford in the UK there is an electronic medical record which is a shared record which uh, 
links both all the hospital related events, the healthcare resource uh, events, the GP visits, the pharmacy prescribing and dispensing and therefore enables you to look at, at outcomes across the, the spectrum of data collection. And this is done behind the scenes so that the patient's participation in that process is not a necessary thing except that they are the person to whom these events are happening. And what they showed was a significant reduction in exacerbation rate in the entire population um, as well as in the primary effectiveness population, that is in the group who had had exacerbations in the previous year. You see the rate of exacerbations was higher in them, but in the group that had not been selected on that basis but had was part of the wider population, they still showed the same extent of uh, exacerbation reduction. So um, uh, this enables, this kind of study design enables uh, patient populations to be kept as near to everyday clinical practice as possible. It maintains the patient experience as close to normal as possible so you don't have the clinical trial effect. It embraces the heterogeneity of patients with comorbidities and a range of other things happening in their lives apart from participating in a clinical trial. And, um, and it therefore has a great deal of usability for the end use of the prescriber. Uh, in this study, this, the, the exclusion criteria were three. People who'd had an exacerbation the previous two weeks, i.e. were unstable, people who were using long-term oral corticosteroids, so you couldn't have observed the, the benefit of the inhaled steroid, and those not expected to survive 12 months. So really, very robustly, um, not ex excluding the majority of people from the general population. Um, and so this is an approach that we could take to um, uh, how we could conduct clinical trials that are still randomised but nevertheless are randomised with a much, much broader population in, my, in mind. And this enables prescribers to answer the question about whether or not this patient is in the study, uh, that this patient's eligibility criteria are represented in the study and that they would not have been excluded. If they had have been, what would have been the case um, and is the exclusion such that the clinical trial results do not apply to this patient. Uh, the meaningful response is evident in, in the reduction estimation when you've got data that provide you that information very accurately as, as was the case in the self and studies. And, uh, and then the clinician can decide whether or not that reduction which is statistically significant is something that the patient would benefit from. So that's my final comments. I'm really happy to take questions after Marissa has uh, presented, but I'm handing it back to her now. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Christine, for that. And now I would like to hand over uh, the presentation for our second speaker for today, uh, Marissa. And Marissa, you may begin when you're ready. Okay. So, look, uh, I think that was really interesting listening to Christine uh, speak to us about respiratory disease, um, more particularly COPD, and the importance of undertaking more uh, generalizable research um, and measuring how people actually respond um, in the general population and, and to use endpoints which have been well selected uh, to really measure the effect of a treatment and therefore to be able to make decisions about prescribing. So what I want to talk about just for a couple of minutes before we go to questions is how we do that and um, how George Clinical and the George Institute work together to do that. Um, and so on this slide, is this is the model that we work under, George Clinical, um, on the green side of the slide is a CRO and we provide a full service, um, a, a full range of services. But in this context, the important thing is the way we partner with the George Institute and other scientific institutes um, on the purple side uh, of this slide to really bring that science that you've just heard a lot of together with um, quality delivery so those results can be collected and um, uh, analysed and published. So this slide is here mainly to show you that we uh, have a very high Asia-Pacific presence. Um, the George Institute and George Clinical are, are headquartered in Sydney um, and have always worked extensively in Asia and this is particularly um, important when we're talking about respiratory disease 
um, as there is a high concentration of, of patients, obviously, in this region. However, we are um, an organisation that can work globally, and certainly for scientific leadership and for endpoints collection, uh, we do work globally, and that's what I'll just talk about for a couple of minutes. So what is scientific leadership? Um, well, for our customers and for our scientific leadership is that value of bringing someone like Christine, a thought leader in a therapeutic area, into the trial early to uh, help the customer and um, in terms of clinical trial design. And Christine has articulated very nicely the depth of um, detail and thought that needs to go into the uh, best way of designing the trial to get the desired outcomes um, and robust outcomes. But our scientific leaders also help us engage with um, very strong site networks that are uh, leaders in their fields and also have clinical trial experience in that field. And that helps us as a CRO to get trials off the ground in the best sites. The other piece where scientific leadership comes into play is to motivate investigators throughout the trial. So someone like Christine speaking to our investigators makes sure that they feel very, very highly supported on a peer-to-peer -peer level, not just on an operational level. Um, and this really aids with uh, recruitment and retention of patients, and retention is so incredibly important in these longer outcomes uh, focused trials. Importantly, uh, we can't leave it all to the scientific leaders who are the brains trust. Um, we do need to support them operationally to make sure that those communications uh, with all of our site networks are very robust. So that's scientific leadership in a nutshell. Um, and the other piece that's very important here, following on from Christine's uh, presentation, is how do we collect and adjudicate endpoints? If these are going to be the uh, criteria that really drive the results and drive the applicability of the results, then um, these need to be very carefully selected early on at that trial design stage, but then also processes for collecting them um, across vast numbers of countries, uh, often general practice populations, um, and then being able to analyse those and report them. And this is where the team at George Clinical has really developed alongside the institute to work on endpoints and outcomes-driven studies. It's a mixture of medical staff together with uh, endpoint coordinators and we work very closely with those scientific leads, people like Christine, who are, have developed the design of the study together with our customers. We work with adjudication panels. These are global adjudication panels, really important to have people from all the various parts of the world who um, can interpret uh, the endpoint data that's coming in uh, with a view to the clinical practice as well as the um, absolute details of the protocols. So what has George Clinical done in endpoint adjudication? Well, we've been doing endpoint adjudication for 15 years and we've gathered thousands of endpoints from uh, 50 countries around the globe. And um, recently we've just finished a program of studies uh, with pivotal cardiovascular and renal outcomes demanded by the FDA um, and uh, managed those adjudication panels, managed those endpoints, reported them back um, to enable that submission to be completed. So these are the countries where we have collected endpoints. So we're based in Australia. We have operations throughout Asia, also the US, and um, in Europe, we have project leadership, but endpoints can be collected from any country around the world using our um, online uh, web-based endpoint collection and adjudication processes. So this is a global service that we can run from Australia very, very effectively. <laughs> 
So right from the very beginning, uh, it's the selection of that endpoint adjudication committee um, that's important, and then they work with the steering committee of the trial to ensure that the right endpoints are selected, and consideration is, to, is given to how effectively they can be measured, collected, and adjudicated. And I think Christine spoke very, very well about some of the complexities that surround um, the selection of the right endpoints. Uh, and it's at this very early stage that the adjudication panel will work on that. At that point, there's also documentation um, collected to make sure, pre uh, prepared to make sure that the um, process is very well documented, that there is a strong charter, there's a plan, and there's operations manuals that are utilised by the sites by the monitors, the CRAs, and by the um, adjudicators so that everybody is following exactly the same processes. And finally, um, I think this is my last slide, the, there is a, a large element of training to make sure that those uh, documents are followed. And then there are regular meetings of that Endpoint Adjudication Committee um, to ensure that the processes are being uh, evaluated throughout the trial, these are often long trials, that any um, dissents on the double adjudication are being resolved and that the, um, that the data is all being adequately um, collected and QC'd in the online system. So that's just a short um, introduction to the more logistic, practical side of uh, managing the endpoints, which become that very important data to enable the prescribers to make the right decisions um, based on more generalizable data. So with that, Diana, I'm happy to hand back to you to um, manage the Q&A. Thank you very much, Marisa, for that. And now, indeed, we are moving to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. And I invite our audience members to continue sending in uh, their questions. And my first question that I have here uh, is for Christine. And Christine, uh, the question is, in regards to trial design, how do you reconcile the pragmatic approach that the scientific community recommend with the specific data that regulator, regulators expect? How do you manage these uh, two, at times, competing aspects? Uh, thank you to the person who asked this question. I, I think it's immensely important question. And I think, unfortunately, the regulators uh, do drive this very, very specifically designed study uh, type which, as I said, does not satisfy prescribers. And uh, reconciling the two, I think that a well-conducted effectiveness trial is probably the way to go. Obviously, other sources of data, and I believe that the FDA, for instance, is um, opening up to other sources of data such as long term observational studies, again, they tend to be real world, but they're not an RCT embedded within the real world. And, and so I think that very well designed uh, real world studies with background data collection, minimising the clinical trial impact, even to the extent such as was in the Salford studies where the patients did not have any difference in the, in the provision of their medication. In some countries, Clinical trials, um, most countries provide medication free, whereas they don't in uh, clinical, in real world. And that is a deterrent to patients being adherent. In the UK, it, it was exactly the same as it is free to them. And so there was no clinical trial effect that was truly likely to be significant in the Salford studies. So I think that really very, very, very well designed and obviously if they're well designed they're more likely to be um, published in highly ranked journals as was the case for the Salford COPD study and I think that too is something that influences regulators. So uh, strong peer review, strong publication, strongly designed, robustly real world nevertheless. Thank you very much, Christine, for that answer. Uh, just another question here. I believe this is for you as well. How can existing data, such as patient registries, be used to enrich the data sets of RCTs? 
Yes, um, patient registries are really valuable. Um, I think that they can tell us the, the sort, well first of all they can, they can provide a source of patients who are willing to be involved in RCTs and I think that's very good because the patients have gone into those databases by virtue of the impact of their disease usually um, and so they are a potential patient population for RCTs. Um, RCTs that are more broad and don't pre-select to uh, such an extent that they're not representative of that database is important. The patient registry itself can be very useful if the patient's medication has or interventions have been well recorded. So as long as the registries are adequately funded to meaningfully be updated and to look um, appropriately at levels of intervention, treatments, different medications, classes of medication, as well as just particular medication within a class, I think that is, that can provide really very useful information, even though it's not an RCT strictly. Thank you, Christine. Uh, for that answer, we have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. And please uh, join me in thanking uh, both our speakers today, uh, Professor Christine Jenkins and Dr. Marisa Peterson. Thank you both for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. If you have further questions, uh, please direct them to the email address showing on your screen, and that's to Scott Clark at sclark at georgeclinical.com. And at this point, I would like to thank everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event, and a survey window will be popping up on your screen, and your participation is appreciated as it will help us improve our future webinars. And we hope that you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.